Hello, everyone. It looks like everyone's um, joining our next session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone's, I want to give everyone a minute to connect to audio, make sure you can hear me okay. Um, my name is Nina Prater, and I'm a soil specialist with NCAT based out of our Fayetteville, Arkansas office. And I'm excited to get to share with you this session today, Indigenous Perspectives on Soil Health and Water. And um, I will be introducing our two speakers today, Kelsey Scott and Dr. Enrique Salmon. So first up today, we will hear from Dr. Salmon, who is the head of the American Indian Studies Program at Cal State University, East Bay. His career has included work on the topics of indigenous ethnobotany, agriculture, nutrition, and traditional ecological knowledge. He has spoken at numerous conferences and symposia on the topics of cultivating resilience, indigenous solutions to climate change, the ethnobotany of Native, Amer Native North America, and ethnobotany of the greater Southwest, bioculturally diverse regions as refuges of hope and resilience, and the language and library of indigenous cultural knowledge. Dr. Salmon is author of the books, Eating the Landscape, American Indian Stories of Food, Identity, and Resilience, and Iwigara, The Kinship of Plants and People. After we hear from Dr. Salmon, we'll get to hear from Kelsey Scott. And she is the director of programs for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. She is the owner of DX Beef, a direct to consumer regenerative beef operation on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation, where she also ranches with her husband and family. Kelsey's passion lies in working directly with land managers and producers in promoting regenerative agricultural practices and community based food systems. Kelsey is excited to see how her work with producers can continue to enhance their connection to, <clears throat> excuse me, to consumers in an effort to relocalize more resilient food systems. Kelsey is a family-focused individual, a soil and plant nerd, and a youth advocate. And if you'd like to learn more about either Kelsey or Enrique, they have um, a lot more information about themselves on their speaker pages in Whova. And um, so throughout the uh, presentation, please put your questions in the Whova Q&A, not the chat. We'll be looking at the Q&A for questions and we'll have plenty of time at the end to get to those questions. And just as a final reminder, this session is being recorded. And so now I would like to give the stage over to Dr. Salmon. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Rex, also for inviting me to this conference and then to the others for getting us all put together, Omar and John. Guidaba, Nehe Ramuri, Nehe Taraitpame, Chomari, Nehe Sari, Zuruki, Nehe Sari, Chochenyo Ononi, Chiba. I'm Enrique Salmon, I'm Ramuri, I'm Parrot Clan. I'm coming to you from Chochenya Ohlone country over here in the East Bay, part of the Bay Area, um, south of Oakland, California. I'm going to um, try in a half hour to um, explain a lot of things. I probably have too much to talk about, but we'll see how far I get. And I'm going to share my screen. And can you see this here? Okay. <laughs> um, we still need rain spirits, indigenous perspectives on soil health and water. I came up with this title because I was reminded of something that happened a number of years ago. I was, I put together an ethnobiology conference. And when I was a professor over at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, and one of the speakers for a session that I had put together was a Hopi elder, Eric Panglingjamwa. And there he is 
um, holding up some, some willow that my students and I were involved in a project with. And he gave a talk and after his talk, someone asked him, why don't the Hopi use irrigation? And he thought for a couple of moments and then he said, if we used irrigation, we would no longer need the kachinas. And what he was referencing was that the Hopi way, and in, in a lot of, in most cases, the traditional indigenous land management practices focus on working with what's available instead of, of trying to overcome the limits of the limitations of what's available to them in their landscapes. And as I mentioned here, indigenous land management practices avoids optimization of resources, which are ultimately unsustainable. When we try to over irrigate, that causes problems. When we try to over fertilize, it eventually causes problems. And for indigenous communities, it's mostly about, as I mentioned here, a resilient approach. I'm bringing this, I'm coming from resilience theory that I've applied to a lot of my work and which finds eventually cultural reorganization leading to adaptive and sustainable land management. So this is just a fancy way of saying using what's available and working with what's available on a given landscape. And this is for traditional indigenous land management practices, the way that native peoples have been doing this for, for centuries. Before 1993, when Santa Clara Pueblo indigenous scholar Gregory Cajete began to publish about what he referred to as native science, there really hadn't been that much academic attempts to analyze and gather data regarding American Indian perceptions and cognition. In other words, the way we think and how we know related to soil and water management and how those perceptions influenced our practices and the choices we make on a given land landscape. Uh, about 22 years ago, I started to, to publish about this and came up with this notion of concentric ecology. What had happened is that a colleague of mine, Dennis Martinez, and I were trying to we we're getting ready for an Ecological Society of America conference, and we were wanted to present this idea of indigenous peoples acting as keystone species on a landscape. And we were also tackling with how, as indigenous people, we could express what we know from an indigenous perspective in a non-native format. And we started to think about for native peoples, everything around us is a relative, it's kin. And that's where we came up with this notion of concentric ecology. And from there, I've been working ever since of how to um, present these indigenous models in a way that non-native peoples can understand and present using academic models and data connected with concentric approaches to um, the impacts of land and soil and water from this concentric ecological approach. And so in a nutshell, concentricity, concentricity comes from this idea from an indigenous perspective that, you know, there's this innate human need to feel related to nature and wild things. And think about how, you know, why do non-native people, you know, people in general, why do they wanna bring plants into their offices? Why do people wanna hang big you know, paintings and pictures of mountains and, and streams and other landscapes in their offices and in their homes? We just, there's like this need for us to feel connected to the wild and to the lands out there, to nature. The land and the beans of the land and sky have played a direct role in our emergence from an indigenous perspective. We owe our place here on the land from our creation stories to various animals, to the land itself, to insects. In my people's case, the Ramuri, we emerge 
from ears of corn. Um, all of this is reflected in our ceremony, in our art, in our narrative, our oral literature, our stories, our songs, all this concentric relationship to place is all there if you just know how to look for it and how to ask. And as a result from you know, Native peoples who still carry on our traditions, we are intimate with our places, the seasons, the personality of the land. We live as a part of a place as opposed to imposing ourselves on a place, which takes me back to how I began, how we still need rain spirits. And we work in this adaptive reorganizational uh, um, relationship with the land, working with what the land has to offer because to us, the land is a relative. It's our, our as you've probably heard, our mother. It's the place that nurtures us. In my, my language, we refer to it as gawi wachi, the place that nurtures. And this very place, because it is a direct relative, it remembers everything. It remembers all of our actions and practices on the land. And as a result, our values, our morals, our sense of identity comes from the very places the land is used to remind us of proper behavior. And for an example, when I mentioned narrative and ceremony and ritual, my people, we perform these ceremonies throughout the year. They'll be starting pretty soon. They're called Yumari. And they are a form of performance art where we, we pray, we honor the land, women dance as symbols of, of the reproductive parts of flowers. And all of this contributes to our healthy landscape and to us as well as people. And the songs that we sing in these ceremonies recognize the links to everything around us. And the performance acknowledges our responsibility to its, its life. And this is a very different approach. Indigenous approaches to land management comes from a responsibility vantage point as opposed to a rights-based vantage point. We are responsible for everything that happens and so that impacts our choices and our practices now, in the past, and also with future generations to come. Another example, if we go up into the Pacific Northwest, where we have trickster stories, and we find trickster stories throughout in um, indigenous America and around the world in general. And in this case, Raven is a trickster, and he has played a direct role in bringing, for example, Clinket to, to life, to the earth. And something else that happens in these stories, they're more than just legends and myths encoded in a lot of these narratives or ecological understandings and ecological knowledge. These stories reflect deep ecological understanding and eventually result in land management practices. And so over time, after Europeans arrived, and I'm going quickly through this stuff here. This is something normally takes a whole semester to teach to my one of my classes. Um, when Europeans first arrived, North America in this case was treated like this huge garden. It was this managed landscape. And it was, for the most part, sustainably managed. But then with the advent of the Spaniards, other European peoples, and then the Mexicans in the greater Southwest, and then you know, over here throughout North America, you know, the Americans come, we've seen this huge reduction of native impacts. In other words, native peoples being moved off their lands. You look at these numbers, you know, we have a 98.9% removal of indigenous peoples. 41.1% of tribes have no federally or state recognized land based. 
And those tribes that still have a land base are only on about 2.6% of the historical land base. And as a result, all this land that was sustainably managed with this huge garden has been exposed to today, especially climatic changes and risk. In other words, we haven't been able to manage the land like we used to. And this has have, had, had detrimental impacts on the land, on water courses, on the, you know, the loss of, of topsoil, on the decrease in, in species diversity. And you know, we could argue back and forth if we had more time, if we were actually in the same place, we could talk about this some more. But this is just some numbers that I'm you know, offering my perspective of where I'm coming from as, as an indigenous person. And some of these changes have led to challenges on the existing landscapes, that 2.6% that I men mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of my work has been on the Colorado Plateau, the arid region of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and also in Northern Mexico as well, where my people are from. And we've seen as a result of this change of land tenure, aquifers depleted. There's been, because of climate changes, ongoing drought for the last 25 plus years. The rain patterns have changed. There's been species movement. For example, pinon pines literally moving further north than where they have been for the last several centuries. Um, we're seeing the introduction of non-heirloom seeds that have impacted the the heirloom seeds of the Hopi and Navajo, Havasupai, and so on in the greater Southwest, synthetic fertilizers further in depleting the soils. And as a result, the Colorado Plateau is drier. It's, this image here is of a spring that used to be. Um, Eric Palignama was he wanted to show me this sacred spring on the Hopi reservation. And we walked out there, you know, it was a couple of mile walk. And he was, I could, you know, his, he was so crestfallen when he came around the corner and this is what we found. It's gone because of the depletion of, of the end aquifer underneath the Hopi and Navajo reservation. And then the impact of climate changes as well. And this, this is impacting the existing agriculture on this landscape. People are still out there farming. A lot of people feel that native peoples are gone. We're no longer practicing our traditions. Well, we still are there. We're still, you know, the Navajo, for example, are still farming on ancestral Puebloan lands. And other people refer to these as the Anazasi. Remember, the Navajo came here later into the greater Southwest quickly reorganized and adapted and figured out that they could grow their corn on these old Anazasi fields. And I'm quickly moving through this. Um, these fields that I'm referencing, these indigenous land management agricultural fields and land management practices are today refugia of resilience. So in other words, these are places where we can look for how to adapt to what we're witnessing on the land with regards to soil and water in this case. These practices do have a direct impact on the ecosystems. And we see here Eric Palignama in his, his blue cornfield. And it looks dry, it looks arid because it is. But what people don't recognize is that underneath the, the soil there are an incredible array of microorganisms that the Hopi, in this case, have been managing for centuries because of the way they grow their corn. Most of the time when we plant corn in modern agriculture, we plant in straight rows 
which you also see here. But we, we thinned the, the corn plants so that it's just single stock corns. And we also, before that, even till the soil, we disturb the soil, we disturb the, the microorganisms in the soil where we expose the organisms and the moisture in the soil to oxidation and to dissipation. And the Hopi way, what happens is that, as you can see in this picture here, people like Eric will use a digging stick. They'll dig a hole really, really deep in these sandy soils, plant several up to like six or eight um, corn seeds, take a big step, dig a hole again, and just repeat. What happens is that the corn stalks grow, and you can see they're short, that's because they started 18 inches deeper in the soil where the existing moisture and, and uh, nutrients are there. And as the corn grows, they support each other. The stalks support each other from the wind being blown away. And um, let me see if this is going to work for me here. Something else that happens is that they plant on, on very um, low level um, fields, low level angled fields. This is an exaggeration, but what happens is that any kind of, of moisture, any kind of water that hits on the higher end of the angle makes its way down. And this is where they'll mostly plant their corn where the, the angles get, uh, get lower. And so any moisture that hits there now, this time of year when it's still raining, when it's still perhaps snowing, is gonna gather there. They plant their seeds really, really deep, like I mentioned, sometimes 18 inches deep down into the soil. And then the seeds sprout down there and have plenty of time to still access to the soils and the nutrients that are still there. And I'm gonna go back to that previous slide. And I'm, there we go. And so what this practice does is that it helps the soil hang on to the moisture that's there. It regulates the soil temperature variability and improves mostly in this, from this one study from just recently, nitrogen availability because they're planting their seeds so deep in these sandy soils. This practice also encourages species diversity. So not only is it good for the corn and the beans and the squashes that they grow, they actually, in the, in the case of the Hopi and also my people do this, and I've seen this with auction farming in Southern Arizona, they discourage um, digging up useful things that we might call weeds. For, from the indigenous perspective, weeds, are just useful plants with a lousy press agent. So in other words, weeds are something that can be good. They can be, and they encourage these useful plants like kinopods and so on, growing around the edges and sometimes amongst their field. And you see right here in this picture, um, there's actually tumbleweed, but when they're allowed to grow to a certain height and Eric and his wife, Jane, actually would collect them about this time and they're really good edible greens, even though it's an introduced and invasive species. They just find a way to work with what's available there. Um, this practice also creates microhabitats. And other practices, non-till planting um, protects, as I mentioned already, the microorganisms and retains the moisture at the same time. And that's coming from another um, study from American antiquity from a number of years ago. And I can see already that I'm, I'm going too, too long. But this is just an example of what I mentioned before, when people like Eric will plant, they'll dig this hole and you can see some of the seeds down there and they just cover that up, move on a few feet in this practice and you know, repeat, so to speak. And so from this indigenous way of, of growing, of managing diversity is not an accident. It's not an accident that in 
some of the most biodiverse regions around the world still today, we find indigenous communities who are still practicing their traditional land management practices. A recent study showed that in 25 of the most biodiverse region, 18 of those places still found indigenous peoples managing these landscapes. And so this is, like I said, not an accident and reveals what Dennis and I were trying to introduce at the Ecological Society of America conference that native peoples are keystone species on these landscapes or can be keystone species on these landscapes if we're allowed to predict this, pr practice our traditional land management um, agricultural practices. And I wanna switch gears here, going back, going to my people and some of the things that we do to try to revitalize our landscapes, our soils and our water especially. So here's a picture from a few years ago where a bunch of my people are meeting to discuss what we need to do. And what do we need to do? Well, for several decades, the Mexican government in Chihuahua, Mexico, in the Sierra Madres, this is about 200 or so miles south of El Paso, Juarez border region, um, been watching our soils erode because of over harvesting of the old growth forest. And we've also been exposed to narco traffickers forcing our people to grow opium and marijuana on our formerly um, corn and bean fields and so on. And so here's a meeting where we're trying to figure out what we need to do. And Maria Elena here in this picture, the woman in the yellow is saying, we need to go back. We need to revitalize our soils. We need to go do what our people have done for the longest time and stand up to the loggers. Luckily, in recent years, the Mexican government has realized it's economically more efficient to let us take care of the land as opposed to over harvesting the trees. Because people are coming to the Sierra Tarahumara to not see these bare landscapes, but to see our people, to see the way we've been living for centuries. The narco traffickers are still there, but that's another, another story. So what we figured out is little simple things like this. It doesn't look like much, it's just a bunch of rocks that are piled on a piece of a landscape that had been overexposed to the logging. So in other words, whenever it did rain, it would rain in these, these fast and furious sheets carrying away topsoil because of the over harvesting of the trees. And we started in different places constructing these little check dams and that's this one picture there. Here's another one, a little bit bigger of a check dam. And it's either not that big a deal. They're just in, in strategically located places. And there's a couple more, as you can see on the left side and right side of that, that boulder. And you can see the, how exposed the soils are um, because of the over harvesting of the larger trees. Here's a group of people that got a little ambitious <laughs> it's not just a check dam. It's a little bit bigger one, but still serving the same purpose there. And then here's the result. Again, you can see how, you know, it's the landscapes over um, the topsoil is gone, but this was, this picture was taken a year after an original check dam was put right back there among those trees. And you can see a little bit of the water coming back. And there's just another picture again, a little close up the water coming back. So in other words, what's happened, we started these projects about 10 years ago. And within a couple of years, the water table is actually coming back to the surface in a lot of places, just because of these little check dams. And with the water, this topsoil is also coming back. And it's easier for us to find places where we can grow our corn. In this place right here where there's, there's this water, this would be an ideal place. And you can see a little bit of a check dam right back there. This would be a perfect place where we would practice what's referred to as auction farming, where taking advantage of the natural angle of the land 
where the water was going to flow down, we would actually put our corn and beans right here where the water is and just and continue our ceremonies, offer our prayers, and wait for the rain spirits to do their work. And so, in short, you know, all of this is resulting in this population management where we practice um, selective planting and harvesting, not just of our crops, but also of useful plants and so on on the landscape itself, where our extractive technologies are just digging and tilling, weeding and pruning and coppicing and selective burning. So practices that are extractive, but are sustainable and don't over harvest because we are working with our relative, that place that nurtures us and doing this in a selective and scheduled way. There is whole um, ceremonial calendars that, that um, we hold in our minds and the elders hang on to them where we look for certain signs and movements of the sun to tell us when it's time to do certain things. We wait for the advent of certain plants to blossom. We wait for um, these tubers to rise out of the ground. You know, you would think of them as sago lilies that tells us when it's time to do our first planting of corn. And so we just, again, waiting for the land to tell us what we need to do. And as I showed you before with the check dams, we create habitat type, which eventually leads to successional stages of, of growth and movement of plants and water and soil, and then controlled burning, which is still a successful management too, if we do it in the right time and in the right place. And then landscape management, where we, again, as I said before, we plan and pattern seasonal round of management activities. So we know exactly when it's time to burn. We remember exactly when it's time to plant our first corn, second corn, third corn. We know when it's time to, um, to sus suspend hunting sometimes, to suspend the cutting down of trees and so on. And we will, actually in the case of the Hopi especially, practice rotation of harvesting. And coming back to my people, for example, when I was growing up, we actually were responsible for about seven different cornfields. And we would move them throughout the year to take advantage of how a place has been fallow for seven years, and we'll come back to it again. And then we'll just keep these this uh, rotation going. Um, I remember throughout my life having to run sometimes up to 20 miles a day to go and make sure each one of our fields was being taken care of properly. And so I can see how I'm getting short of my time and I will stop there. And I had to run quickly, but it's amazing how quickly uh, 30 minutes passes. <laughs> If you want to take one of my classes for a whole semester, we can get deeper into a lot of these things. Thank you so much, Dr. Selman. I would love to take one of those classes. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, Omar, did we have any questions in the Q&A yet? Or should we move on to Kelsey and do questions at the end? Uh, we have one question here if we want to touch on it. Go ahead. All right. Um, so what recommendations might you suggest concerning better concentric management of our agricultural systems, which don't have much in common with indigenous approaches? Well, as I was saying throughout my, my presentation, we have to figure out a way to work with what the land has to offer us instead of this optimal kind of, of practices where we, in the case of irrigation as I, that I started with, we um, are, practices today, we, we, we know that the plants need water, but we are, what happens is that we, we are negatively impacting the systems 
that we're working with, if we think in terms of systems thinking, where we want to optimize the use of water, but what does the optimization do? It actually disrupts the natural occurring system by putting too much water on a, on a soil scape. And water is a good thing, but when there's too much water, it depletes the, the topsoil. It starts to deplete the aquifers underneath the landscape there. It forces us to find ways to optimize even more because now we've interrupted the system and we introduce, introduces um, invasive species, it introduces pests that come onto the, the crops that we're trying to grow. That it leads us to try to have to, to have to use pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And so instead of disrupting the system by trying to optimize, we need to work with what's available to us and figure out, like in the case of the two examples I showed you, you know, how to make that work to our advantage. Irrigation isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's done in a sustainable way. A, a, an ideal example that I would have included if I had an hour to speak would have been another example from Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado with the, what's called acequia farming, where they tap the local Hispano farmers tap local creeks and stream with these little narrow acequias. They're, they're basically just little shallow ditches. If you got a running start, you can just, you can jump over them but they're, they're short. They only go for maybe up to three quarters of a mile at the longest. And so it brings water to the fields, but as opposed to what we see in like places like Arizona and here in the Central Valley, where we have these huge, deep, wide irrigation channels, you know, we lose half of the water to transpiration before it gets to the fields. The Secchia farms actually act as highways of diversity because they're shorter. Yeah, very interesting. It uh, looks like we have one more question here. Do your people and others in the Southwest burn at the end of the monsoon season or other times? Um, not towards the end of the monsoon season. It would actually be earlier, about this time of year, when we'd be doing our burning and also earlier. It might, in, the people, in the case of my people, they've already done any burning that they would have done over the, the winter time. And where I'm at here in California, it'd be about this time of year. And you have to remember native Californians were not agriculturalists. And so it didn't matter if they were burning for that might impact their agricultural fields because they didn't exist. But you don't wanna burn at the height of, of, um, of the hottest time of year. In the case of the Southwest, not during the monsoon season because that's when you've already planted and you're waiting for the rains to come, starting around July and going into September. But that's been all interrupted, unfortunately, because of climate changes. It's hard to tell when, if the monsoons are gonna come if at all. Yeah, a lot of uncertainty all over, the, all over the place. Do we have time for one more or do we need to move on? One more quick question would be fine. Okay. Let's see, an argument for increased irrigation is to increase productivity. What is your community's attitude towards the productivity of traditional systems versus the more mechanized modern systems? Well, I would argue, I would debate that, that increased irrigation leads to increased productivity. It does lead to productivity, but there's been several examples here in North America and especially in South America where using traditional indigenous practices of uh, aquaculture, for example, where it's this mix of planting crops and aquaculture, where you're raising um, tilapia and other plant-based, oh, excuse me, water-based agriculture, that the productivity is the same to modern practices and sometimes even larger. Um, I don't think it's necessarily true that modern or irrigation practices leads to increased productivity, eventually leads to disruption of the natural systems. And look what we see now, because of modern irrigation, we have this huge dead zone 
you know, at the Gulf of, of Mexico because of all the pesticides and herbicides that have run off the top so into the Mississippi and down into the Gulf. We need to change that. Yeah, factoring in the costs of irrigation for sure. Salinity, for, to add one. Um, okay, well, it's 1040, um, so should we move on and then maybe get to the rest of the questions later on? That sounds great, Omar. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Salmon. And I look forward to hearing you more in the Q&A session after, after we hear from Kelsey Scott. Go ahead, Kelsey. I'm Pete Washte. Tatea Akwalawi Lakotia Imachiapi, na Kelsey Scott Washitiye Imachiapi, Wakpawashte Himataha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelsey Scott. My Lakota name is Soft Little Breeze Woman, and I am a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, which is now located in uh, North Central South Dakota. Um, I will just lead off by saying what a presentation to have to follow. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Salman, for everything that you have contributed in your career, really, to recognizing and appreciating the um, often forgotten realities uh, that this landscape had tremendous stewardship um, all across the nation. Uh, you know, we there was such diverse ecosystems, um, and we can look back to some of the documented accountings of uh, journals of the settlers or, you know, even in in our own indigenous stories that have been passed down most often orally. Um, there's such a unique world that I think is hard for many of us to even fathom what used to exist and, and what used to be the idea of increased productivity across the con across the continent. Um, I am coming to you all today uh, from my family's ranch. Uh, we are cow-calf regenerative beef producers on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation. Um, we also have a direct-to-consumer grass-fed beef business that we use to work to um, do our part to try to heal and rectify some of the damage that we witness in our local food system. I also get to serve as the director of programs for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. We are a national nonprofit organization that it has a headquarters in Billings, Montana, but we have uh, a program team all across the nation, uh, including Alaska. And so um, I feel very privileged to get to be here, very humbled to get to help share the story of the work that what we do here at the IAC and some of the successes that we see on the ground. And I'm gonna do my best to correlate um, some of this conversation back to the importance of uh, indigenous waterways and indigenous uh, recognition of the ways which water is so deeply intertwined with our kinship with nature. Go ahead and share my screen here. I really value and appreciate um, the ways in which uh, Dr. Samon shared the importance of knowing our kinship, um, not only with one another as humans, as one of the keystone species of this continent, but also with the nature that surrounds us and recognizing that we're expected to be good relatives. Um, I really see our role now with the present um, reality of our food and agriculture system in leaning into reconnecting some of our food ways and, and revitalizing some of those, those trade routes, um, those knowledge uh, bases that have been have gone silent and have maybe been dormant like the seed in the soil for a while, figuring out how we can kind of trigger that system to bring those stories back to light and to uplift our indigenous ways of thinking as some of the mindsets that are practiced in our food and agricultural industry. I always like to start off my conversations uh, with a little geography quiz. Um, and I would like everybody to reflect on what this map may be indicating. Um, recognize that there's some different shading. Yes, the states and the country boundaries are there, uh, but there's different shading there. And many of you probably are familiar with this map. Um, this is Indian country today. It is a reservations map of Indian land still under Indian management across the country. 
Um, I circled in green where I'm from, just in case there's people joining from across the country. And if you're wondering where exactly it is, I call home. But unfortunately, um, there's a lot of similarity between that last map and this map here. And this is no car and no supermarket store within a mile, which is indicative of USDA defined food desert. And what you'll notice as you go back and forth, I'll try not to give you guys uh, motion sickness here, but if we go back, um, identify within your own state, if you can, a location where there is an indigenous community or Indian land indicated with the shading and correlate that with this map. And unfortunately, you see so much overlap in discrepancies um, where you see Indian land and you see a food desert that is experienced by those residents. Um, but we've just heard in the last conversation in the beginning of mine that we're the original land stewards. We had such a deeply connected kinship with our food sources. Um, so, so how can this be? Um, there's been a disruption in, in our way of appreciating and valuing where our food comes from uh, all across the country, really. But when you look at this map, here is Indian country 1492. And what also this map can indicate is regenerative ag practices in 1492. Local food systems that were established and vibrant. Farm to school that was happening every single day. Quality governance systems that had effective ways for dictating jurisdiction and ensuring that there were regulatory bodies in place and healthy water cycles. And so I just really like to call out the fact that while our present state of food systems in the majority of our uh, communities that are home to many of our indigenous populations, the present state is not ideal and it's not one that we have chosen. It's one that is drastically inappropriately matched with our cultural ways of being with our food system. And the work that we do here at the Intertribal Agriculture Council is working to revitalize and, and uplift our community leaders in taking back claim of what our food systems look like and reestablishing what that kinship is. And our goal uh, in providing a unified effort to promote change in Indian agriculture for the benefit of Indian people, ideally would be to have our systems become the model that we can then work to carry beyond our present reservation boundaries and help to educate and share with some of our partners um, all across the country that have a desire to have a food system that is meaningful and impactful and regenerative, but perhaps don't quite have that indigenous framing of mindset through which they can view the system quite yet. I want to start with just a little bit of background about the IAC. Uh, we were actually established through a congressional act um, in 1980s, the late 1980s, on the heels of the farm financial crisis which was compounded in much of uh, the Western reservation lands by a series of natural disaster events, a group of tribal leaders came together and they approached Congress and they said, we need, we need more assistance than the disaster pro programming that you're currently delivering. Um, and Congress said, okay, well, what gives? Why does Indian country need more? What exactly is um, causing Indian country to need more support than the non-Indian uh, counterparts in the same state. And so Congress commissioned a report and the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs uh, report actually found that there had been a historical underservice by USDA to farmers and ranchers of Indian country. Farmers and ranchers during that time of Indian country were five times more likely than the national average to be foreclosed on. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, I highly encourage you to pick up Sarah Vogel's book. She also reads it on Audible. It's called The Farmer's Lawyer. Uh, she brought upon a class action lawsuit to the USDA that called out some of the discriminatory practices that were taking place uh, by allowing the regulatory nature of some of the federal funding that was um, being utilized through some of these programs 
to become something that was discriminatory against the producers who were facing some of the economic and natural disasters that were happening during that time period. Uh, so we were established as a nonprofit by through an act of Congress in 1987 uh, with the goal of ensuring that we would serve as liaisons and translators and um, the synergistic relationship that needs to happen in order to rebound from some of the underservice that we had experienced in uh, USDA resources reaching Indian lands. In 2011, uh, with the bringing of the Keep Siegel lawsuit uh, against Secretary Vilsack in the United States Department of Agriculture, our technical assistance program launched. We were actually able to um, place a regional technical assistance specialist in each of the 12 Bureau of Indian Affairs regions. Uh, as a result of having a on the ground expert that can serve as those uh, as one of those liaisons that is bridging some of the gaps that have been created through federal policy, we recognized a need for a focus on our uh, a concerted focus on the next generation of young leaders and so our youth programming expanded in 2014. And in 2019, with the Keeps Eagle settlement, as well as the Keeps Eagle fast track funding and the new endowment of the Native American Agriculture Fund, we really saw a new beginning in Indian agriculture where there were tribal communities, tribal uh, producer cooperatives, tribal producers themselves who were empowered to start to take back the narrative of what it means to be an Indigenous producer involved in our food and agriculture systems in a way that helps to inform um, a grander level of policy shift to help to embody some of that Indigenous mindset. We have a variety of programs here at the IAC, from youth to technical assistance, policy and government relations, our natural resources programming. We have our Native Food Connection efforts, which are um, led by our American Indian Foods program. Um, and we also now are building out what we are calling our regenerative economies work. Oops. And why is it so important for us to have such a diverse set of these programs? Well, because it's all interconnected. We're, we're all related in the system of food and agricultural production. And we learn that through some of the ways that um, we know our ancestors helped to care for this land. I mean, truly, they were the original water cycle stewards on this landscape. And there's so much that can be learned from the practices, many of the practices which Dr. Samon already uh, discussed. Um, but there's there's teachings in the way that we had these relationships with nature that I think that even in what is now considered um, or often referenced as conventional agriculture or large scale agriculture, you know, if we can explore some of these theories in those practices we'll actually see our bottom line, our productivity, our relationship with the land all begin to improve. And it's a way of thinking that views the entire living system as a, um, a cycle rather than an input and an output. And the living systems embrace the fact that there needs to be natural disturbances sometimes. Um, recently, I follow many Regen Ag groups on Facebook and about six months ago or so, I've come across a post where somebody had said, uh, made the claim that we just need to call it what it is, regenerative agriculture is indigenous agriculture. And I don't get very loud in, in groups. I don't like confrontation. I don't say a whole lot, um, but I was like, my ears peaked up and I'm like, I wanna know how this thread goes. That's kind of a somewhat progressive statement for this group that I'm in. And I was really taken aback by a lot of comments that were being shared. Um, there were some, a group of individuals that agreed and concurred and had similar arguments to offer. Um, but then there was an opposing opinion and the opinion was all from the premise of the fact that indigenous peoples would start wildfires they would have, um, you know, massive buffalo jumps. You know, all of these things were like correlated to as indications of indigenous agriculture not being regenerative. And it just took me a while to really contemplate and consider why somebody or why a group of people may have that perspective. And what I 
come to appreciate in reflecting on this is that we often in our current agricultural production systems, we forget that disturbances are a necessary and natural component of nature. And we have to lean back into that awareness and that a relationship with those necessary disturbances to recognize that indigenous agriculture or indigenous production styles or indigenous stewardship of the land, whatever title you would like to give the way our peoples existed on this landscape in prior to 1492 and still today, these practices are still alive. Uh, but we have to embrace that those production styles did not resent disturbance. In fact, they often really lifted up the disturbance and appreciated and valued that the disturbance is a result of creating resilience within the crop, um, within the people, within the wildlife, and that the disturbance is often a way that nature is sending us a message. And nature sends us a lot of messages. I just think that um, as one of nature's keystone species, we're not as good at hearing those messages anymore. Um, one. One of those messages uh, being a, a friend of mine recently shared that it's it's now um, sap season and, and they had gone to check their taps and the day before a storm that the weather center had not predicted, uh, the, the sap stopped running and the tree stopped sharing their sugars, sharing their energy with the humans and the storm come up out of nowhere and when the storm happened uh my friend was able to be aware enough and and recognize that wow the tree knew that that storm was coming and the tree was preparing it knew it needed its reserves to be able to withstand what was about to come um, and so there were all of these ways that we monitored the water cycle and we we monitored our relationship with these plants and animals to recognize and appreciate and value that there's messages that can be shared with us, especially in those disturbances. We served as original carbon and nutrient managers. Um, the idea that in you know native peoples started wildfires. Um, well, right now people still start wildfires. Unfortunately, that's one of the leading causes for the devastations that we see every summer throughout the greater West is people starting wildfires. Um, the thing about indigenous cultures, which Dr. Samon discussed is that um, it was a controlled burn. It was a effort to help to cycle the carbon and nutrients in a way that the land needed. Um, in a way that would generate a regrowth and a rebound in the coming season. And it wasn't necessarily something that was done every single year from what I know. It was done based on instances where the land was telling them it's time, this is needed, this is the disturbance that is necessary so that um, we can continue to produce in the way that we know that the land um, can. We were herdsmen and women. Um, I, I recognize that at one point, indigenous people only hunted a foot on this continent. And to think of how um, one agile you must be and, and how stealthy in order to be able to sneak up on a cottontail deer or a rabbit uh, are caught in, in, but then you get to the instance where um, we're, we're all animals as skittish as they are now, or was there a relationship that we had with the animals? Was there a deeper connection that we had? Um, the perfect example for this for my own people is at one point we had wild dogs, coyotes, right? They, they were our, um, they helped us to move our homes. We had travois and they would carry them as we moved from one camp to the next. And now the main thing that happens when you talk about coyotes in this neck of the woods is people are out hunting them because they think that they're killing livestock. Um, and I just think that the relationship that our ancestors had with the coyotes ancestors uh, that 
that must still be alive in not only our genetics, but theirs too. And um, I don't ever take it as an offense when I recognize a coyote walking through one of our pastures or coming close to my home. Um, we have a relationship and a kinship to one another. And as long as we have a respect in that relationship with one another, that's just me being a good herdswoman. And, and that's me being a good relative, uh, same with them. And so we, we often consider that uh, the hunting aspect of indigenous populations um, was one of stealth and, and one of extreme skill, which I'm not at all going to say it wasn't. I hope that I never have to go back to solely getting all of my food from my own hunting ability because I don't think I will be very good at it. But I also think we had a deeper connection with the wildlife around us. And I think that we had an ability to cooperate with them in providing for our families. As the original foragers and planters, uh, we were aware of what messages the plants were telling us as they moved through their production cycles. There are many plants in my neck of the woods that have been said to be uh, the messengers for when it's time to return back to where we planted our seeds for the harvest. Um, so when those flowers come into bloom, we know that our harvest is ready and we can return to where we planted our three sisters gardens. Um, and that's, you know, getting back to the comment that was mentioned about um, irrigation to increase productivity. Um, I think one of the things that we can really learn from our indigenous production systems is there was such a diversity in our cropping systems um, that we did not have a monoculture of crops that were competing for access to water at the same level within the soil profile. Um, we actually had diversity in the crops that we would plant with one another. Um, and that wasn't just so that they didn't outcompete each other for resources. They actually had a synergistic relationship where they supported one another throughout their life cycle. So the three sisters, if you're not familiar, was corn, beans, and squash. So we would plant our corn stalks next to our bean plants, next to our squash plants. And the pattern that we would um, plant those seeds, the corn would serve as the stalk which the bean would climb up. And the squash would flower out the way that squash plants do and serve as a natural defense against the weeds so that the other plants didn't have to compete for the sunshine and for the water resource that is available. Um, each of those plants have different root depths. So they're taking minerals and water from different depths within the soil. So they're not competing with one another. They also have different elemental needs. So one does not have a sincere need for nitrogen that the other one also has. In fact, one of those plants is a nitrogen fixer. So it actually generates the nitrogen or increases access to nitrogen within the soil, which is needed by the very nutrient or the very um, nitrogen demanding plant within that system. And so we just recognize that maybe our, the, the industrialized idea of what productivity is, isn't necessarily the way that nature um, has created herself. And so maybe we need to think about productivity through a different paradigm. And all of this information did not uh, make its way through generation upon generation upon generation of civilization by just existing within one person's mind. Um, we were uh, the original educators and mentors in food and agricultural sciences on this continent. We had a way of living our lives to constantly be passing on the knowledge to the next generation that was coming behind us and to constantly be learning from the generation that has already taken the steps ahead of us. Um, I think that it's really exciting to see the different ways that we're seeing connection happen um, across the country so that we can really revitalize some of these teaching practices to be rooted in a, a cultural awareness and a kinship with the land bases around us. Uh, but I think that there's a lot that we can learn from the indigenous ways of teaching that um, quite honestly conflict with the, the very sterile institutional 
form of schooling that exists in this largely in this continent right now. Um, those exploratory learning lessons where you're outside, you're engaged in nature, you're connecting with nature, they're so, so critical to um, remembering that identity that we share with the DNA that is all around us in nature and to embracing the kinship that we have with our water cycles and with our cycles of nature. Um, the only way that we can practice uh, seeing the world through those living systems views is to actually be out there in nature and, and learning from what nature's living systems have to teach us. Here's some more pictures of some of the great mentorship work that is taking place across the country um, that primarily my team is responsible for. I wasn't there for any of these um, any of these pictures, but I really like to see that teaching happens across generations. Um, it happens in facilities out there on the land. Um, a variety of crops are involved. We get to see collaboration of multiple partners um, bringing together this safe space for learning and for revitalizing some of those stories. And we were culinary artists and herbalists all across this continent. Um, we had a keen knowledge for the pharmacy that exists out there on the landscape. Um, we knew that there was an importance in eating every uh, particular muscle type and, and organ meat from the animals that we were harvesting. We found we knew the benefit of organ meats. We knew that it was critical to have a particular blend of certain herbs at certain times to combat the allergies. Um, I don't really think that there were ever any uh, native people moving their travoy across the country and sneezing because of allergies and grabbing out a Zyrtec. You know, we, <laughs> we just had ways of knowing that there were medicines in the the nature that surrounded us and that we needed to um, work with nature to care for those medicines and not over harvest them so that we would have them for the years to come and the generations to come and i think it's really critical to recognize that over time our awareness and the utilization of the ingredients that we have access to us have shifted slightly. But that's not to say that we can't still produce them through that indigenous framing of mind. Um, our American Indian Foods Program works with Native American producers, food producers all across the country to um, package their product and to market their product and to really uplift and tell the story through their product. Uh, we have a Native Food Connections uh, box program where if you're interested in sampling some products that were grown through this indigenous framing of mind, um, you can def I would encourage you to take a look at our producer directory on our website. Um, also, you know, we recently ran a Food for Families initiative. When the onset of COVID happened, um, the 4-H uh, communities that are out there serving our Native youth uh, they predominantly make their income generation to be able to have professional development opportunities for their youth throughout the year by um, hosting an annual live auction for the youth to sell their um, animal at. And it's an income generator for the youth. Uh, while when COVID hit, there wasn't the ability to have live auctions. And so um, there was a lot of effort put behind coordinating virtual auctions, um, but really the virtual auction doesn't have the same essence of support and um, competition, healthy competition for the benefit of the youth program. And so what we did was we worked with some of our partners to um, fundraise for the Food for Families initiative. And we offered a processing coupon to all of the youth that were impacted not being able to um, live auction their animal that they had raised for auction. And that processing coupon would cover the processing of that animal, either for them to use to kind of market as a, a premium um, that was coming along with their animal that they were still gonna auction, or they could use it to um, just process the meat and feed their family. We actually had 21% of our youth applicants in the first year choose to keep the meat from their show animal to feed their own family. 
and another 18% chose to donate their meat from their animal to feed elders in need within their community. And so I think that really goes to show that even within the age range of 14 to 18 years old, the native youth in our communities recognize the responsibility that we have to have kinship with um, the nature that surrounds us and to have kinship with the people and to make sure that our food system is as regenerative as it can be. Um, and we're really looking forward to figuring out ways that we can continue to connect with those youth that had the mindset of wanting to um, keep that food local and to rebuild some of the connection in providing for the elders within their community. And we cannot forget the importance of policy shapers. Um, indigenous communities had very strict regulation around their use of water, around their use of natural resources. They were more so considered to be a way of life and rather than a policy. Um, and I don't really think that we necessarily had to worry about the um, the branch of the government that would uh, address crime because these were ways of life and ways of relationship with the nature around us that you just didn't mess with. You just, you shouldn't do that, right? So we had people, many cultures had people who um, were responsible for preparing the food and only they could prepare the food. That's a food safety regulatory measure that was embodied in our culture. And there were particular times when you could utilize um, water or certain ways you could utilize the water either for your crop or for your family. Um, that's a, a water safety standard regulatory feature. I mean, these, these policies that we now have that are enforced um, either at the local, tribal, state, federal levels, um, they're not brand new concepts to indigenous peoples or to this land. Um, there was rules and expectations in how we managed these resources uh, long, long before there was a U.S. government. And the really unique thing to be able to be a part of here at the IAC is um, a recognition from our indigenous communities that, hey, people are finally getting excited about this idea of a living system relationship and they're calling it regenerative agriculture. Um, we should be involved and we should really take our place and, and recognize ourselves and one another as indigenous land stewards that um, have been practicing these living systems approaches to production. And so my team at the IEC uh, created the Regen Nation Seal and Pledge. Um, the Regen Nation Seal and Pledge is designed to work in tandem with our other American Indian Foods product um, programming. Um, we want to really uplift the present day American Indian food producers in telling their story and, and shaping and informing the consumers about the ways that they are producing with that living systems approach in mind. And so I think to close my section of the conversation out today, I will go ahead and play a video for you all, um, which really highlights what our regeneration pledge is all about. I pledge to strive to work in tandem with my animals, land, water, and crops to develop a mutually beneficial relationship with them in tune with the environment and self. I pledge to have a genuine connection with the ecosystem and the citizens of my tribal, local, and global community that promotes its greater well-being. I pledge to promote the renewal of ancient and native-led wisdom to my agricultural endeavors that returns us to the type of practices that have been regenerative in nature for generations to come. And so really, I want to end on that note because I think it is really important for us to appreciate and recognize um, the ways that not only we can uplift those around us that are focused on this regenerative living systems approach, 
to revitalizing some of these indigenous mindsets and their production practices, but to also reflect on how, how can we start to learn from the original land stewards of this continent and what ways can we start to shape our kinship with those around us, whether that be living or non-living and um, really just begin to re-indigenize some of the ways that we have these discussions. So thank you all so much for hanging in there with us today. I look forward to connecting with some of you. That is my contact info. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to give them a go. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was really, really great. Um, I, I just feel like I'm taking in so much and I keep hearing um, certain concepts and phrases repeated um, both by Dr. Salmon and by you, this idea of connection and collaboration, systems approaches and things like that. And I think those are all really important in agricultural systems. Um, uh, for us to, to keep thinking about. So thank you so much for your words. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, Omar, do we have some questions from our audience? Yeah, we have a few here. Let's jump right in. Let's see. I guess this might be for either or both. Um, how can the Hopi practices like working with available resources be scaled up to commercial scale agriculture designed to feed 8 billion people? as opposed to the roughly 500 million global population in the 1600s. I, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Um, I think that the biggest lie that we tell ourselves is that we have to feed the world. I don't think that is a fair responsibility to put on the shoulders of our present day producers. Um, I think that we need to find ways to revitalize the system so that the world has the ability to feed themselves. Right now we have so many people who don't know anything about being able to plant their own garden or to grow their own food box in their windowsill or that they do have a choice in spending their food dollar and that they can spend that food dollar with a local farmer or rancher. Um, and so I, I really think that that paradigm of thinking and thought in the fact that I need to maximize as much production as I can out of my available resources so I can feed the world. Um, I, th I think that's that's an impossible way of thinking. Um, and I think that it contributes to the reasons that we see farmer suicide rates continue to increase. That is an unbearable weight to have to carry on shoulders as a producer. And we really need to just be aware of how that is impacting not only the well-being of our producers, but also the well-being of the land that we are managing in a, a way that is fairly exploitive to try to accomplish um, what, you know, what, what we think we have to. And, and maybe take a look at some of the food wastes that we see um, across the countries. Uh, that, that's a pretty outstanding number when you look at the amount of pounds of food that is wasted every day. Um, that right there, just figuring out the food waste issue and getting more of that food into people's mouths rather than having it go to waste would address a large amount of that disparity in population numbers that you just pointed out. I would add to that something that I teach my students is all native knowledge is local. People have this idea that you know, because you have the Hopi people in the Southwest that their knowledge of growing food and managing a landscape is the same as the Lakota up in the Northern Plains. And it also points to the idea that we have to manage our lands and grow our food so that it's distributed locally. Then you avoid these big, huge transportation links that can be easily disrupted by economic and also natural disruptions that happen all the time. And by looking local, then we optimize, in this case here, I try to avoid the optimization, but we optimize what that local landscape has to offer. So in other words, as Kelsey was saying throughout her, her talk, it's all about just altering our thinking, our approach to where our food is coming from. Here in California, you know, we shouldn't assume that we can get tomatoes year round. 
although in the Central Valley, you can grow them year round pretty much. And you can't assume that we get, you know, fruits, you know, from that would normally come from the East Coast here year round and vice versa. We have to think, change our approach to how our food comes, where it comes from, and when it comes. Then that alters our, our practices and the choices we make with regards to what food we're going to have. So in other words, we, we take a seasonal approach to eating in this case. And I like, I loved it when Kelsey mentioned the impact or the lack of impact of, of allergens. In, in the old days, we ate what was available during the season. And that was a way for our bodies to work with the seasonal changes throughout the year. And I think a lot of our, our, our medical problems are as a result of the foods that we're putting into our bodies, or maybe the not foods that we're putting into our bodies. Thank you. Okay, this next one's for Kelsey. Um, do you have, is there any plan on transitioning your ranch to raising bison as they have evolved in a plains area? Yeah, so I would love to, we talk about it often because I really just think, um, one, they're just a magnificent beast of an animal. I mean, my goodness. Um, I don't know if you, whoever asked the question has gotten a chance to interact um, in person next to, to bison a whole lot, but man, they just carry so much beauty um, and, I, and knowledge. The big thing for us that prevents us from being able to is, um, you know, bison, just like my ancestors, uh, traveled as far north as Canada, as far south as Kansas, east to west from Minnesota to Montana, Wyoming. Um, they're a nomadic creature and they are, they have evolved um, on this ecosystem to have that way of life. And so when the settlement of the West happened, what happened is many, what I believe happened is many of the more docile, more inclined to be around people, uh, bison were the first to be massacred um, as settlers come across and harvested them for their, their skull and their hides. And what we have remaining is a, uh, a variety of genetics. Um, many producers have done a great job of making sure to select to get that docility back into their herd. Um, but for us personally, to be able to contain an animal that evolved to move south when the snow was flying and to move north when it was getting too hot down south, um, the infrastructure cost would just be too significant. Um, we've talked about buying a couple and working like just for, through a couple of generations to see how long it would take for us to embrace that focus on docility and selecting their genetics until they can, um, you know, respect or appreciate the same um, confinement structures that our cattle do. But our, our cattle respect a single wire hot wire fence as an exterior boundary. Um, and I, I think, I don't think I've met a bison yet that wouldn't giggle at that and just like jump right over and, and move on because the grazing is better on the other side. Um, so infrastructure is a big um, prohibiting factor for us. Another one is um, we can take our livestock, our cattle to a local livestock auction market and there's a market for them. Um, the market is not superb or superior um, in this area for bison. Um, in fact, it's it's sometimes hard to find a buyer. You have to have a direct buyer that will buy the offspring right off of your place, or you have to have a captive market who will purchase 100% of your um, packaged meat product. So there, there are a couple of, um, I guess, industry reinforced barriers uh, on top of the natural barrier and the cost infrastructure that just prohibits us. So what we do is we do our best to manage our cattle herds in the way that the bison would have the impact on the land. So we do everything that we can to generate that um, migratory herd impact. 
So we have um, a grazing system in place that keeps our cattle compact into one herd. Uh, we rotate them on the land in a manner that never utilizes the land at the same time, multiple years in a row, or even two years back to back. Um, we also ensure adequate rest periods and we do um, select for animals that really have that nature to have a, um, a preference towards what the ecosystem has to offer here. Uh, our animals don't need a whole lot of input. Um, they just have been evolved themselves to exist upon the resource base that exists on our ranch. So those are some of the ways that we're coping with the fact that we can't afford <laughs> to fully get into bison right now. Okay, yeah, here's a follow up question uh, to that. Have you given the Gallagher invisible fence system a try with your cattle using electric wires and collars? We have not done the invisible fence system yet. Um, I do have a couple of colleagues that are in trials with it. Um, some of the things that they're running into issues around is either and I don't know if it's specific to the Gallagher, so I, I shouldn't say that it is, um, but um, if, you're, if your animal is too far away from the home base satellite, um, then it doesn't send the appropriate trigger or message back um, and just like connectivity issues. Um, we recently, um, recently our connectivity on Cheyenne River has improved drastically because of the tribe's efforts to increase connectivity, but um, I would definitely um, need to do more research around how adequate the technology would work here. Um, also, it's relatively expensive. Um, if we're talking about 230 collars to put, um, collars with technology that indicate um, an ability to keep animals within a confined GPS point location, um, I would imagine that that cost is, is pretty um, expensive right up front. And my cows like to swim and do stuff like that. So I just wonder, like, it just makes me wonder. They would, I feel like they would be turds and I don't know. I, I imagine going out and seeing a deer wearing one of them one day or something. <laughs> you never know what to expect. Um, yeah. I have a question if I could jump in, Omar, um, for both Dr. Salmon and Kelsey. Um, you've both mentioned, um, you know, learning to read the messages that nature is sending us. <clears throat> and I know that our participants here today are from all over the country. And so I know you can't give us, you know, specifics since, as you said, all, all native knowledge is local. But if you were to offer advice to non-native people who want to get better at this, these observational um, making these observations to be better uh, farmers or ranchers um, or just citizens of the of the earth. Um, where, how would you, uh, what would you offer us to to just get started on this path? Well, um, make sure my microphone is on. Okay, um, there's this online journal called a journal of educational or sustainable educational or education something like that and they asked me to write an article and it was based on something that i have my students do and i was teaching a, a class called native science and i wanted to figure i figured out a way to get my students to get this a tiny taste of what it's like for a traditional American Indian, um, how we look at, at our, our the landscape. And what I had them do was something really simple. They had a choice of once a week watching a sunset or a sun, sunrise. Of course, most of them chose the sunset. And they would go to the same place, the same time of day, looking in the same direction and just watching the sunset. And then they would journal over it for over the whole semester. And what happened is that uh, over time, as I was reading their journals, I was watching their awareness of everything going on around them expand, noticing the move, movement and changes in insects and plants growing 
the movement of animals and so on. It was just in this a semester long practice. And by the end of the semester, I'd say a good quarter of them wanted, you know, they, they told me basically they wanted to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And this is in an urban environment where I'm teaching in the Bay Area. And so if kids, you know, college age kids in an urban environment can have their awareness expand by just by watching a sunset once a week, then I think other people can find different ways to just expand. That's all it is, just expanding their awareness, stopping. Instead of reading, I think Kelsey alluded to this as well, instead of reading all these technical things, just be out on the land, you know, in this case, once a week and just stopping and watching what's going on to start to you know, grow a jalapeno plant in your doors, you know, in your backyard or out the back door or in your windowsill and just watch what the needs are of the plant and how it changes based on your reactions and your actions and practices around the plant. Simple little things. I love that. I might need to start doing it. Um, <laughs> the, the other um, offering that I have is one good way to really challenge or to consider and to just be aware of your ways of thinking. Um, and if they are regenerative, and if you're trying to find the living systems there, or if they're degenerative, and you're trying to like put things in boxes and just wipe them away or, or check the box and consider it, that's how it is. Um, any pest, pest in your system or in your world, it evolves to have a role. Mother Nature didn't create pests for fun. Um, nature created these pests or what we call pests for a specific purpose. And I think that a, a great way to kind of challenge our thinking a little bit is to recognize what we've identified as those pests in our in our world in the nature around us in the system that we're trying to produce within and start thinking of them as your ally and start to consider what is this being this organism trying to teach me and or what message is it carrying and how can i work with this ally instead of killing this pest um and and uh, there's just a it's a practice that honestly can apply to whatever system you're in similar as um, to dr samon's and it's it's just a simple way of trying to train our thinking to be to have a different nature to it and to to consider that perhaps it's us that has that nature of being a pest in the system and, and to just be aware and to consider um, what those pests are trying to tell us. Yeah, uh, speaking of animals that can be viewed as pests, there are certain keystone species like grizzly bears and wolves that tend to um, be antagonistic as far as like some ranchers' perspectives. I wonder if there are any native perspectives or management techniques um, that you can share with regard to those species. I would lean into Dr. Samon's recommendations that the, the um, knowledge is very local. So it depends on the particular keystone species that you're talking about. Um, but what you've brought, I think that you kind of answered your question, your, question in your question um, and and it's that in thinking about how peoples existed in that environment before and to just be really aware and cognizant of the fact that there can be a harmony there um, but we have to recognize and appreciate sometimes that nature does have those disturbances um, and we can have livestock that maybe are a little smarter and they know to avoid particular areas of the forest where there are um, grizzly bears, or we may have a production cycle that allows us to be out of the forest come the time that the grizzly bears have their young so that they're not as aggressive. You know, So there's different ways of thinking that we could approach these systems. Um, often I see the largest barrier or, or um, factor that prevents that mindset shift for farmers and ranchers and agricultural producers across the country is the industry level forces that they are trying to work within 
unfortunately. And um, I think that so much of the antagonism is driven by the pressure that our individual producers face to try to uphold the industry standard or to try to meet the demands of the industry. And so we just have to be a lot more aware of what the industry, what, what the messaging from the industry is and um, try to think about it from the perspective of the producer who's up against the big four or whatever it may be um, as far as their industry woes. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are no more questions in the Q&A box. Um, if there's any more out there, please feel free to populate that. Um, but otherwise, I'll pass it back to Nina. All right, well, thank you both so much for your time and for <clears throat> what you've shared with us today. Um, I know it's really um, opened my mind up to, and I'm, I'm definitely going to try that journaling. Uh, exercise that that sounds great thank you again so much kelsey and dr selma and this was really really wonderful